started. Uh, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, good afternoon to some. Welcome to the final day of the 15th Youth Court Summit. I'm Chuck Urban, president of the California Association of Youth Courts. Thanks to our Youth Summit team, we've had an amazing array of speakers and in sessions in the past two days. Take a deep breath and prepare to pivot a bit for a rapid run through 10 youth-led ideas. These ideas encourage involvement in civic activities and help grow the youth justice movement around the world. We'll save some time for questions that you can put in the chat, Zoom chat. Scott Peterson, founder, chief executive officer and board president of the nonprofit Global Youth Justice Corporation is going to lead the way. I attended one of Scott's Global Youth Justice training conferences a couple of years ago, and truly global it is. I'll never forget the presentation by a New Zealand youth justice team. They had traveled from halfway around the world to be there. New Zealand is an island nation where the customs and practices of the native Maori people permeate their modern society. They follow an ancient custom when they are introduced to people. In greeting a new acquaintance, they answer the questions, who am I and where do I come from? We engaged that way then and had a sensational experience. Likewise, I now share with you, I grew up in Vallejo, California, a product of the public schools, graduating in 1969. Like some of you, I was challenged by some adverse childhood experiences and made some mistakes. Some would say I did things the hard way. As poet Robert Frost reminds us, I took the road less traveled by and that made all the difference. For the past 10 years, I've been a California Superior Court judge in Sierra County. Before that, I was a lawyer with a solo private practice for 26 years. I always try to set my goals high and never give up. Yes, I'm wearing a Jerry Garcia tie. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Scott Peterson. Please give Scott a warm welcome. Scott, who are you and where do you come from? Uh, well, today I'm coming to everybody from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I live uh, about a half mile from here in Cambridge, about a mile, uh, about a block or two from Harvard University. Um, as Judge Urban said, uh, thank you Judge Urban for having us in the California Association of Youth Courts. Uh, the Judicial Council of California. Noah's done a great job and Don and all the young people who've organized this. Uh, we're real glad to be part of this. Um, my name's Scott Peterson again, uh, not the one you might know of in California or up in the state of Washington, the other one. Um, um, I was early, uh, got involved early out of college. I opened a homeless shelter in New York when I was just 20 years old, uh, actually 21 years old. And one night I saw a teen court on TV, that was back in 1993. Um, and that was in Texas, Odessa. And so I got hooked on these youth court and teen courts. Um, and I didn't know I would go take it from a local level to a state level to federal and to now to global youth justice. Um, in 1993, we started our first nonprofit. It was called Youth Courts of the Capital District in New York. Um, and we started youth courts throughout Albany, Saratoga, Schenectady, Rensselaer. Um, and by 97, we'd replicated that in 50 communities throughout uh, New York State. Um, and then I had the pleasure in 1997, I was visited by our first uh, female attorney general, Janet Reno. Um, she came and visited the youth court we started, um, that I had started in, uh, with a group of people. And she asked me to come to the Washington DC and work for the United States Department of Justice. So a few months later, I packed up from New York and I moved to Washington DC and I started at the Justice Department in 1997. And we launched the federal youth court program Back at that time, there were about 300 youth courts. Um, fast forward to today, and there's over 1,800 of them. Uh, now in 47 states, District of Columbia, uh, 25 tribes, uh, 11 countries, and the dual nation island of Trinidad and Tobago. I stayed at DOJ for about 10 years, and then I left in I, uh, 1997 to 2008, I worked there. And then we started Global Youth Justice Up. Um, and we started Global Youth Justice initially, Judge Arthur Burnett, Honorable Arthur Burnett, some people might know him. Uh, Judge Burnett's almost 90 now, but he was the first African-American federal magistrate judge in the United States in 1969. And Judge Burnett and I started a youth court up, uh, Global Youth Justice. And by um, 2011, um, it was growing. So in 2015, as it expanded, we turned it into a nonprofit. Um, 2018, we turned Global Youth Justice into an international nonprofit, um, and then we launched it again in 2019 um, as a charitable 501c3 organization. Um, and all that time, these local programs, a lot of people who are watching them now uh, are volunteering in them. Uh, nobody had the idea that it was going to be so widespread. 
Um, today, there's over 100,000 young people around the world, um, typically grades um, seventh grade, sixth, seventh grade, up through 12th grade that are volunteering um, in local youth courts. Um, there's different models. Uh, there's over 120,000 young people a year that are being diverted now. And this has been a textbook example of a grassroots movement. Um, it's never been funded by the government uh, to the local ground, which makes it even more impressive because these have spread because so many of the adults and communities and the young people, they help their neighboring communities or tribes. Um, so it's really grown from word of mouth. You have some now about 10 states, just like this going on today in California. Uh, with the sponsoring organizations who are taking the lead and making time. Um, like Judge Irvin, I, I know he's done a real good job. People are real proud of uh, California starting to uh, be more active on a state level. And so we're glad to be part of this today. Last week, we part I participated in one from New Mexico. Uh, we had a New England one the week before. Um, so we've got a lot going on. And I know a lot of people are watching from all over. And today, I thought rather than ramble on like I, I just did for a little while, um, but I thought rather than that, when Judge Bern um, Irvin and I, I keep wanting to call him Judge Burnett, our, our board vice president, maybe it's a foreshadowing, he'll come be part of us. Um, but Judge Burnett's not here today. He, uh, he went through this yesterday. We put together a list of um, 10 different things everybody watching can do for local programs and um, young people can take the lead and do. And uh, one of them is right behind me. If you're looking at what's behind me, uh, this is the 9-11 flag of honor coming up on uh, September 11th this year is going to be the 20th anniversary of the bombing of the two twin towers in New York City, Flight 93 going down in Pennsylvania, um, and the Pentagon Memorial being um, hit by a plane. Um, and why I mention that is uh, for the first time, Global Youth Justice submitted a federal grant application to AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps is the lead federal agency responsible for Martin Luther King Day, um, as well as 9-11 Day, which is September 11th. Um, so we this year, Global Youth Justice has the lead. Uh, their CEO of United Way Worldwide and uh, me as the CEO of Global Youth Justice, we have the lead for the country in involving young people um, in recognizing 9-11 Day, participating, doing things. Um, and this flag is one of the first things we'll talk to you about because there's an opportunity for that. How are we doing so far, Judge Irvin? Am I talking a lot? Doing okay? Just checking in with the boss. I guess he can't talk, so that means I get to talk more, huh? We don't hear him. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to go through with you today, and there's a link that Noah put into uh, the chat room. Uh, we've got a list of 10 different things we put together. I thought I'd take about two minutes and go through each one. Uh, the young people who are watching, uh, volunteers in the youth courts, or people call them teen court also, they call them peer court, uh, they call them student court, um, and peer jury, they're probably the five main names that are used. Um, California, a lot of them tend to be um, youth courts in California. If you look at Chicago, a lot of times they use peer jury. Um, a lot of the southern states, the way it's spread locally, uh, they use teen court, like Texas and Florida and North Carolina. Um, so it really just varies, but they are largely the same things. Um, so what I did today, and it's on our website too, when you click in the um, chat area where you see the link for the 10, I took these 10 different things, ideas we have, uh, practical things that you can volunteer and do. So I wrote up 10 different things and they've got the links to participate. And I posted them on the Global Youth Justice website, our website. Um, and you'll be able to uh, click on that link and it'll take you right to each of the 10 of them, as well as links where it makes sense to be involved. Um, and the Global Youth Justice website, one of the unique things with uh, youth courts and teen courts, they're public domain. Um, and that's pretty rare. So if you're like Big Brothers, Big Sisters America, local Big Brothers, Big Sisters are, it's a federation, but they're copyrighted and trademarked. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the good thing with youth courts is a public domain. So really any community can start these up. Uh, you don't have to pay an initiation fee or annual fee. Um, in Global Youth Justice on Purpose, everything is public domain. We don't wanna own anything. We wanna give it back to the world and encourage people to um, expand these diversion programs. So all the publications, resources on our website, um, everything is free. Um, we don't charge to be a part of it. And so that's a good thing. Um, and I think there's a kind of a, 
collegial approach to it that everybody kind of likes and people do a lot of the sharing. I know a lot of the King Courts in California, they've helped other communities. They participate and help for when they come. We've had 25 trainings, Global Youth Justice. Uh, more than 2,000 adults have attended and we've had more than 200 participants um, have actually volunteered to train their peers like Judge Irvin and uh, I know some of the programs throughout California. I've visited about 10 different youth courts in California. Um, I spoke at your first um, California uh, Youth Court Summit, which was 15 years ago, I believe now. I was still at the Justice Department then. Uh, we came up to uh, 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 California and we um, that was a good time. We had a lot of fun there. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is um, if you, we have 10 different things uh, that I, I'm gonna tell you that I figured at the end of three days, Judge Urban and I thought we'd give you some things you can do. Uh, the first one I alluded to right here, this is the 9-11 flag. And all of these lines right here, they all have names on them. And there's 2,993 names. Uh, 2,887 people actually died on uh, September 11th. Um, and that leaves six names. Uh, prior to that, in 1993, on February 26th, there were six people that were killed in the World Trade Center bombing. Um, which between the two is now 2,993. And this is called the flag of honor. And so what we have right now on our website, you can apply three young people a minimum or three adults minimum or three adults and youth can apply. Uh, your youth court can apply. If you're a police department, a court, a religious group, foundation, informal youth group in school, you can apply to be one of 100 communities that participates in the first annual 9-11 flag of honor across America uh, memorials that are gonna take place this up upcoming uh, September 11th. And what we've done is we're giving every site 50 different names. So out of these names, every one of the 100 that signs up, everybody will have 50 names, they'll get an email with them. Um, and you take each name, like if it was Scott Peterson, and you go to the 9-11 Memorial uh, website and you type in the name and then you hit enter and it pops up a one-page bio, a picture on the person that died, uh, as well as some information. Did they have children? Uh, were they on the Flight 93 plane when they took the plane down, passengers on the plane? It'll tell you what, what their circumstance was that day, as well as if they have other, some bio things. And we're gonna get together around the country um, on September 11th, and we are gonna have 100 communities, and everybody's gonna get together around a flagpole or some other public area, and they're gonna raise this 9-11 flag. Um, we bought 100 of them, um, and every flag tomorrow morning, we're getting up, myself and our 9-11 day coordinator, Carol uh, Sabin, who we recently hired. Carol and I are getting up at six in the morning here in Boston, and we're taking the Amtrak train down to New York City. We're gonna take all 100 of these flags and we're gonna lie them on the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City in Lower Manhattan. And we're gonna photograph every individual flag. Uh, the 100 communities that sign up, they'll get one of these 9-11 flags for free as well as the picture of their flag on the memorial and they'll get their 50 names and they'll organize about a 90 minute ceremony that day. So the opening, you'd have some guest speakers, then you'd get to the middle part that might be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20. And then the middle part is where you talk um, each of the individual 50 names that are assigned to your spot, uh, your location. You'll mention each name, a little bit of information about them. Um, and that'll be called the We Will Always Remember You section. And then there's a closing part to it. Um, right now we have already 62 uh, sites have been applied for it. Um, we're not picking one over the other. If you commit to do it, um, and you're one of the first 100 that sign up, um, you can go to our website, globalyouthjustice.org, click on that link in here. Um, and the first 100 that sign up, we're just gonna pick um, and treat everybody like adults. We're just gonna put it together. Uh, Global Youth Justice also um, has grants uh, that we've given out for larger projects. Um, but we thought this is a way that we really could remember them all. So that's the first thing on here. Apply to be a lead 9-11 flag of honor across America Memorial on September 11th. Um, in California, I know the community youth courts has already been picked. They have multiple sites. Um, Tanya Clenny, who's terrific there, she's executive director. Um, and then we also have the um, uh, Santa Barbara Teen Court. One of our good friends like Tanya is Ed Q. Ed Q applied and both of them in California are 
two larger sites. And then we have other sites that are applying just to do the flag of honor. So I wanted to tell you about that. That's something that can be done. And it's on a Saturday too. And it's a great way to plan something. It'll be very high profile. Um, the second thing, um, we have write a blog post. The Global Youth Justice website just passed 1 million followers. Our blog uh, entry uh, blog uh, has 4,942 SS subscribers, RSS subscribers. Um, and then it goes out to our email list as well to over 100,000. So if anybody's interested in writing a blog post, someone wants to write about this youth summit, about what your program's doing, ideas for other young people, um, you can write a blog post and you, it has information here where you can contact us. Um, we're glad to have any of you young people uh, or adults that are watching to write a blog post, several of you get together and um, that's something that you can do. And, That'll be shared all across our social media as well. Uh, Global Youth Justice has 25 social media platforms. Uh, we have over 250,000 Twitter followers. Um, just an enormous, um, enormous following because it's really volunteer driven again. And people are actually involved in these, as you know, on a local level. Um, so that's our blog. I wanted to tell anybody if you want to get published and write a blog, we're glad to have you do that. And of course, give credit to you. Um, the third thing I think uh, that is needed, um, we, you know, as these programs really the past 25 years, they've grown from 200 to 300, 500, 1,000, 1,800. Um, you know, we've got a couple hundred now that are trying to bounce back from COVID. Um, we have lost about 100 of them, I would say. As of right now, I think it might go up to about 150 um, based on where we're going. Um, so I think that's um, something that we are, are now going to do a bigger push. So we've got the 9-11 flag opportunity. You can sign up and lead that. Um, you can be young people and do it too. We, we put just youth can sign up um, or you can be adults. Uh, we've got, you can write a blog post about something that's important to you. Maybe there's an experience you learn. Maybe there's something about being on the jury, a, a great tactic for really um, uh, sending a message to the young people. You know, it's not you we don't like, it's your behavior. Finish this, move on. Don't carry a, a label on you like, you're a criminal or something or an offender. We all make mistakes. Um, I ran a youth court for 1993 to 97, and uh, we had about 120 volunteers a year, and they were in teams. They had teams of five, a judge, prosecutor, defender, clerk, bailiff, and four person. Um, that was the youth judge uh, model. And then there was a jury of about seven to 12 youth. Um, so there's an adult judge model, youth judge model. Uh, there's a tribunal model, there's a peer jury model, and again, it's just local. You pick, um, nobody tells you really what to do. But within those different things, how this has spread has been through sharing. So we encourage everybody, if you want to write a post for Global Youth Justice, um, you can do that. And if you get onto our Global Youth Justice website, you'll see as well, right on the front page of it, we have three posts towards the bottom. So you also get put right on the front page of it. And you can say you were published and put it in anything that you might apply for. Uh, the third thing here is social media. Uh, I think it'd be great if we got more of these youth courts um, involved with Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's a great way to recruit more youth volunteers, educate the community. Um, we have YouTube as well. I think this would be great. I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of these taped interviews all throughout the uh, Youth Led Youth Summit. Because um, it's the first one that we're aware of has ever taken place in the United States and certainly around the globe. Um, so I, I don't think we've ever had this before. So thank you again for inviting me and I'll share it on all of our platforms. Um, so we, uh, we're glad to do that. And it's great for the young people too, if you've participated in this um, and helped lead it. Um, make sure and write that down because these kind of things are where you get the experience, which a lot of the young people, ordinarily there's not a lot of opportunities to stay involved with something, right? A lot of time there'll be a service project like Global Youth uh, Service Day it was every April for three days, um, but that's doing something, one thing one day, maybe planting trees, which is nice, but it, it's not continual. So you're really gonna get more benefits from being involved in something continual and you'll feel more attached to it as well. And I think you, you develop more skills. I remember uh, running the youth court and we had some of this, they sign up for a year. So a lot of the ninth graders who were real, maybe shy or you know timid or not good public speaking skills, it was something seeing them a year or two later. Um, and you know, I, I think it's a real good thing they've been involved with and we wanna expand this more. California could have a thousand youth courts. 
so there's a lot of room to grow. And I know we've got some people around the world and country watching. So what else do we have here? Number four, uh, the member of the, uh, the part of youth courts that is about half of them around the country, about half of them do the mandated service themselves. And about half of them um, have placements or services where they go out and do it. The program I used to run, um, which was with Youth Courts of the Capital District, uh, if a young person got 30 hours community service, they completed that through a class once a week where they got three hours at night. And every Saturday we did group work projects. So I had to schedule that one out about two months, but we did the adopt a highway program, we renovated graveyards. Uh, we were at the food bank every six weeks. And it was just endless. We painted the park fences, we went to uh, homeless shelters, um, endless things you can do. But it's important to, if you're not gonna do the community service yourself as a program, um, there's not a reason why at least once a month you can't be doing something for all the young people completing their mandated service. Um, and there's no reason the youth volunteers and adult volunteers can't also come. Um, so I think if you're young people that are volunteering in youth courts, um, talk with your program coordinator, program director, and say, can we start planning maybe once a month or at least every other month, a project that all these young people completing their mandated service can do? And remember, it doesn't have to always be punitive. It can be good stuff um, that they learn from. Maybe a little spark goes on and they get involved um, in something that they find a career out of, right? Um, all these different nonprofits and things they do. A lot of times they didn't have chances to volunteer. And we all know the young people who maybe got referred to youth court for a crime, offense, or violation. A lot of times you're just the ones who got caught, right? Um, so, it, you know, it's something that you can do to help them out and help yourself out. And it's good to all do them together because there's not a lot of difference in the young people. Uh, we all make mistakes, right? There's a saying that says, you know, we all make mistakes just like we all have issues. Just try to not have your issues have issues. Uh, if you can stay out of that category, you're doing a little better. Uh, another thing we have too, for young people who wanna take a larger role, uh, Global Youth Justice has a newsletter. And I started this in 1997 when I worked at the US Department of Justice. Uh, we started a newsletter list, emails of everybody that's been involved in these for all these years. Um, and we just passed 110,000 um, subscribers to our newsletter, both youth and adults. Uh, we have a newsletter about every four to six weeks or major events, like I sent something out on this event. Um, and that's something if you want to stay more updated, I think an important part for the adults and youth involved um, is letting the other adults and youth know that you're part of a lot much bigger movement, right? You're, you're part of this whole global thing going on. Um, this is the most replicated juvenile justice program ever um, in the United States going back to 1899 when the first juvenile court started in uh, Cook County, Illinois. Uh, there's never been something so... Uh, widespread and when there's never been federal money sent to these programs to start these up. So nobody said, here's money for a grant for three years, um, start all these up. And a lot of times those kind of things end. Um, so I think one of the good things to do with the Global Youth Justice Newsletter is let your funders of the program know, let the supporters, um, you can even just email us. If you're a local youth court program or the youth, you can get you know all the youth emails, adult emails, Send us an email with just the emails. We can cut and paste it, send them into the newsletter, or um, just log on to globalyouthjustice.org, our website, scroll to the very bottom of it. In the bottom right-hand corner, there's a, a little box. It says, join free our newsletter. Uh, so there's two ways to do it. Um, but I think it, it, the people that I, I've had, whether it's all over the country, they're like, you know, I added four of our board members or two of our funders. They thought, uh, those people thought there was, this was just a local program. It wasn't part of this big structure. Um, and one of the good things, we don't have a big structure. And a lot of times they don't know about it because there's not a budget like for big brothers, big sisters, where they might have a million for PR and marketing. Um, and so we wouldn't spend that kind of money in here. We don't spend any money on social media. This is organic. It's grassroots and there's no need to. So uh, we're real proud of everybody involved with it and, um, it really helps a lot of programs to do more. Um, next thing, we have collect data and research on youth court diversion programs. This is something if your program isn't doing, you can relatively easily do it, and there's no reason the youth volunteers can't be participating in it. You can collect data, look how many, if your program's been going for three years, five days, see what data you kept, 
Um, and going forward, what you want to keep, you can maybe say we how many males, how many females, uh, what were the ages last year, if we had 150 cases, or we had 50 cases, 36 were petty larceny, five were criminal mischief, three were graffiti, uh, two were trespassing, uh, maybe 10 were possession of marijuana by a minor, but you can keep a lot of different types of data. Um, and it's interesting to see how it goes too. Um, if there's a change in it, you know, or certain uh, people's ethnic or race more likely to be referred to the program. Um, I think one of the good things when you're talking about referring to the program, if your program doesn't have a formal referral um, process that's been adopted, I encourage everybody to do that. That reduces any stigma with not referring a certain person or class of persons to the programs. If the community has a uh, referral criteria that's been passed and they have to make referrals, um, that they need to be making these referrals. And if your case was not sent there locally, you then have an issue with why wasn't my case sent there for my kid to be diverted? Um, but collect data, it's something good to do too. A lot of people, there's a lot of jobs out there for research, data collection, uh, statistics. Um, a lot of people go to college for these. You don't have to go to college for it. Um, but that's another good thing that you can take on a big project and work on it, all of you. And then maybe statewide, you could see if this could be something we did statewide. But that's something if you want a little more technical for some people who like math and things like that, um, that's something you can really get into. And on our website, under the resources, there's a research data collection button. Uh, so go there and it lists 25 different things you can collect. Um, how long did it take from the time the young person was apprehended or charged to when they appeared in youth court to when they completed their mandated service? How many completed, right? We had 105 referrals, uh, 96 completed their peer and post sanctions. And those are important things you not only can do a report on, um, that, you know, it's something you then can share with the community and show what you're doing. Show where, how many community service hours they did. And how much is that if they've got minimum wage and all the work they did? So collecting data and research, another thing, uh, make public presentations. This is a great thing you can do and it'll help with fundraising, help marketing your program. You know, get together and have, you could put on like a team of like 10 of you, right? And put on a little mock or case reenactment sometimes better. Take a case, but past case, but just don't use the name or however you couldn't identify them. Um, and put together a presentation with the young people and travel around in your community, get a list of all the civic groups, the fraternal groups, you know, American Legion, uh, Rotary Club, Kiwanis, go to all of those groups, your town or city hall will have a list of them all. They usually have them when they're running for election, um, but get a list of all those different groups. And then there's the auxiliary groups at times um, and you can go to them and, and say, you know, in the next coming year, we're gonna make 25 presentations, find community foundations, events going on, um, you can put together PowerPoints. And this way you can present the data you collected. You can talk about how you participated in the first 9-11 flag of honor. And then you can hit them up money for uh, recognizing all the youth volunteers so that you all get to go to an amazing amusement park and get some free t-shirts or buy the training manuals. Or maybe your program coordinator is working part-time and doesn't have health insurance. Uh, about half of the adults that run these programs in the country are doing this part-time or a second job. And a lot of them I know like me um, back in the nineties when I did, uh, you know, you just work and you, you do it. Um, so that that's something you can do too. You can have new stations, make it a go before the city council has to be put on. We want to update you what's going on with youth court or your town council um, and all those types of things and um, come up with a plan for it. Let's pick 25 we're going to do or just 10 to start out or five. So that's another thing you can do is you can do local community presentations. Um, another fun thing you can do, a lot of programs do this, about 25% of them I would say, uh, the young people take the lead and they do some fundraising. They do car washes, they, um, they sell candy, they do Christmas ornaments or other ones for uh, whatever holiday, Hanukkah or different holidays. Um, but you can come up with a lot of different ideas where the young people um, actually can take the lead and, and do some fundraising um, for your program. And that's great experience. There's tons of jobs, they call them development or fundraising consultant. Um, you can also work on writing some youth-led grants. Uh, Global Youth Justice will um, have some things we can talk about. 
Another thing, we're going to get to the next thing. It says create an alumni network for your youth team court, your youth courts. Sit down with your program coordinator or program director. And so, you know what? Let's start keeping track. Just like I talked about what we do for Global Youth Justice, um, we keep track of all the emails. Um, and then we have a, through GoDaddy, we, everybody subscribes through there. And now we have a thing through GoDaddy where it's, it's called email marketing. Uh, where anybody emails that gets in, if anybody unsubscribes, they can never get another newsletter, which is good because you avoid spam. But sit down with your program coordinator or director and say, where can we get all of these names and emails and contact information for everybody who's been involved in the past and is involved currently? And what's our plan going forward? Um, you'd have hundreds and then thousands of emails of people and you could have an annual event you could do a fun drive for it. Um, a lot of times these people who are involved in high school, they come back and volunteer while they're in college or when they're out. Um, probably 95% don't go, I don't have an exact number, 90, 95% don't go on to practice law, um, become lawyers. So it's not just, um, there's a lot of different fields you can go into um, for part of that. But creating an alumni network is great. Not all the youth volunteers and the adult volunteers. And that way you're keeping track of everybody. Um, so when you maybe have a newsletter every quarterly or you're doing a big ceremony to recognize the young people um, and adult volunteers, both of them, you invite them. And a lot of people, you know, when you're involved in something when you're younger and you realize how big it's grown part of, um, it becomes part of who you are. And just because you're um, like Noah's in college now, but he used to volunteer and he's graduated now. Um, but as you get older, this is something you can stay involved with. You know, um, I, I like it because it's something that a lot of us, like me, when you had to, in high school, you didn't play sports because usually a lot of people, you have to have a part-time job if you want to have money when you're in school or buy sneakers or things you need. I always worked part-time, um, plus mowed lawns, and I, I worked at a grocery store. Um, but I, if you're volunteering something like youth court, your boss will let you maybe have every other Thursday off if that's when you have court nights. Um, so these are something you can be involved with, with these programs. Um, and it's not a full-time commitment where it's every day after school or, um, so it's just something. But creating an alumni network, I, I think that's just a, a, a great thing to do, keeping part of that. Uh, the next thing, opportunity, the first one I mentioned, um, you can apply for these now, um, apply um, on our website. But the next thing that we have coming up later this year is we're gonna be giving out um, 50 more $2,000 grants for people to do larger 9-11 day projects next year. Um, we're also gonna be giving out 10 $5,000 grants to do state projects. Um, Global Youth Justice just did the first round and we're gonna have two more rounds of uh, grants. But for 2011, this September, just the 100 flag opportunities are left and there's 60. Uh, we had a bunch of people apply for these $2,000 mini grants and they only take about two hours to fill it out. Um, I kept it really short. I figured, you know, we'll base it on the first people who apply, meet the criteria. Um, pick, I don't like picking, when you remember we ran the youth court, we had some adults who wanted to pick out maybe the best youth of the year or who improved the most. I don't like things like that. We, I, we said everybody gets the same thing. Uh, you know, you don't like to pick one over the other. That kind of like not something I like doing. So we did the same with the mini grants. If they applied, met the criteria, um, we gave those out and we uh, had 25 programs we picked, the first 25 uh, that will be doing larger things. So these grants will be coming out in November or December. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get the announcement. Um, and that's to do uh, not only the 9-11 flag thing, but a project afterwards. And then what we're doing, uh, Global Youth Justice has a volunteer management approach. It's called the R-Core approach. Uh, volunteer management is something that's getting very big in the country, especially for essential service. There's a shift from AmeriCorps doing things that are critical in the community rather than just something that's like a one day thing. Um, and our core stands for recruit, train, organize, recognize, and retain. Uh, a lot of youth courts don't get credit for uh, volunteer management because usually we're thinking juvenile justice, um, but volunteer management, what's happened as these youth courts have gone from 500 programs to 1,000 to 1,500 to 1,800 and now around the world. What's happened, not only are you taking more cases, but the volunteer part has started scaling. So now we're not only the most replicated juvenile justice program, 
um, in the US and climbing globally, but now we're in the top five youth service opportunities in the United States, um, which means that of all the programs out there, 4-H, which was a great program, 4-H runs about 50 in, uh, of our local teen courts, especially in states like Wisconsin. Um, but the volunteer part now we're getting credit for. That's why Global Justice applied for the AmeriCorps grant for our very first federal grant I decided to apply for, um, in which we won because it's uh, a huge network of volunteers. And so we'll be getting more into that. Um, but that's something uh, to think more of when you're looking at these programs is for the volunteers and the RTOR approach. Um, is something a lot of programs are using. Because if you recruit really well and let young people know what are expected, when's expected, if you train them well after they decide, okay, I learned about the, what's going on, I decided to apply for it, now I'm being trained of it, then you organize volunteers really well. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't be contacting people a day before a case and saying, oh, you need to be here. You know, just like adults, young people should be provided the courtesy of knowing in advance when they need to be there. Um, and it also helps you adjust your schedule with everything that else that goes in in life, especially if you have jobs or you're in sports or band or another club, um, or you're taking care of a parent or you're babysitting. You know, we all got a lot of things going on. So that's something too, this fall, those grants will be out and we, young people, um, high school and college can apply for them and programs. But I was glad to see we um, picked two in California um, and we uh, hope to do a, a state project as well. I know I spoke to uh, Don Carney, who's uh, definitely one of the leaders uh, in the US and California with restorative justice and his team and they're doing a great job out there. Uh, the other thing we have here, uh, let's see, what was that last one? Apply for grants. And on the back, oops, so we're doing pretty good. We're getting along here. 9-11. Um, okay, and we've got uh, mandated service. I talked about that. I talked about subscribing to the newsletter. I've talked about uh, data collection and research. Um, I've talked about making public presentations. I went through that one. Uh, talked about you can do fun things and raise money. Um, create an alumni network. I talked about that. I talked about the $2,000 grant. I talked about the 9-11 flag. We got that done. Uh, I talked about a global blog post. And I talked about social media. Um, and that's the 10 things I had. I wanted to try to give you something a little more tangible and um, to tell you a little about what's going on with that. Um, what do you think we should do now, Judge Irvin? I'd like to see if we have any questions uh, from the audience because uh, we've covered a lot of material in a very short time. Uh, that was a grand slam, Scott. <laughs> I did, did okay, right? Did well, it right. I mean, 10 minutes yeah. about each one. I have candy here. I'd share it with anybody. Okay. So could have some. Uh, <laughs> maybe Noah or uh, one of our technicians can tell us if we have any other questions pending somewhere. We encourage uh, people to just raise their hand and, and ask the question too. It's still Saturday, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm surprised you got good for 89. And oh, you know, we're going to have two. We're going to be having a conference coming up. Uh, this will be our second one. Uh, young people who are volunteers uh, will be able to come. Uh, we've had 25 trainings, um, 23 of 25 have filled up, and we're going to do our first large-scale conference. We're just trying to narrow down where it's going to be affordable. So when we talked about fundraising, that can even be to bring your team uh, of young adults and the uh, program coordinators to it. Um, we're probably, we're looking at wherever is the least expensive, um, more than 40, 54% of our participants uh, reported um, saying they're paying for half or all of the trainings. So we do a lot of our events in Las Vegas at a place called the Tuscany Suites Resort. Uh, it's off the main strip and resort rooms, huge 900 square foot rooms are only $73 a night. Um, and we only charge $195 for registration, have three lunches and all that. So that's gonna be coming up. We're looking at maybe February or March. Um, and we were looking at, I went to Tennessee um, and visited Dollywood and Pigeon Forge area. Um, we're looking at that area for one. Um, and we're looking at Las Vegas um, and they'd have to come with chaperones. But our first one we did, the 150 slots all filled up. Um, and so we're gonna be doing another one. 
Uh, we've got a training coming up this August um, that is in Las Vegas, the 26th to the 28th, 24th to the 26th. Um, in September, we've got another global youth justice training to establish enhanced youth courts. That's the 28th to the 29th of September in Boston. Uh, we'll be announcing another training in Philadelphia at the Constitution Center. Uh, we're going to do that, um, the American Bar Association. Um, and we're going to be announcing a conference uh, by the end of the year. So there, that's a couple of events we have coming up. Uh, Scott, this is Derek Beverly. Can you hear me? Sure. How are you doing, Derek? Uh, good, good. Uh, I'm a relatively new member to the California Association of Youth Courts. Uh, been on the board for two years. And uh, I, I applaud everything and all the work that you're doing and have done. And if we could mirror some of that and be successful in California, I'm all ears. Um, I put together a newsletter. Uh, uh, we've close to our third edition now. And I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see our newsletter on our website. Uh, mm -hmm. I would really appreciate your feedback. And this goes out to all the people that are listening today is... Uh, please um, look at our newsletter. I need help putting the next issue out. I'm looking always for material for the newsletter. Uh, and uh, hopefully, Scott, uh, we could ask you maybe to promote our newsletter. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I know if you, if you don't get it, you can pull it off the website or I can send it to you. But I would really appreciate, you know, the furtherance of what's going on in California. And I'm, I'm, I'm really not soft shelled and I really appreciate your feedback um, for the, for the newsletter. And I'm also uh, chair of the marketing and fundraising uh, aspect. And uh, I, I'd like to see us apply to some of the grants and we'll talk more later about that. Um, but I just wanted to introduce myself and say hi and put a face with a name and uh I uh, appreciate Judge Irvin uh, being there and uh, mentoring me in, in uh, youth courts. I'm a retired 42-year uh, veteran law enforcement officer that uh, did everything from uh, traditional law enforcement with the sheriff's office to the FBI. So I'm, I'm uh, 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 this is something very near and dear to me. It's different from my normal career path, obviously, uh, but helping kids and youths is uh, a priority for me. So both my wife and I are dedicated to the program and we just want to salute you to, uh, for all the work you do. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Derek. And yeah, if you email me, I'll, I'll next newsletter that'll go out to over 110,000. I'll put a thing in there for them to sign up for the California newsletter. Um, yeah, yeah, and our uh, Lieutenant Gary Kepler's not here today, but Gary's retired now and him and his wife come to all our trainings. We hire him as a trainer. He was a mm -hmm. former SRO officer and ran peer jury programs. Um, and yeah, yeah, I graduated from the FBI Citizen Academy is one of the things that I was uh, glad to do uh, for people who want to take a larger role in society. So yeah, thank you, Derek, for everything you're doing and your wife. Thank you. Yep, I'm, I'm a National Academy graduate uh, uh, okay. and I'm familiar with the Citizen Academy, uh, particularly in Sacramento area. Yeah. Um, one of those that helped initiate that. So anyhow, um, We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We have an input in the chat from Scott uh, Edward Q to Scott. Do you see the concept of youth courts growing, or is it fading away for other new diversion programs? Uh, no, it's just going to keep growing. Um, it'll especially keep growing because we're scaling it up more now. But um, but especially especially because locally uh, is where it replicates from community to community. Um, so I think that it's going to just uh, keep growing. And what we did instead during COVID, instead of slowing down, we took the opposite approach. So all these things Global Youth Justice is doing, um, there's about 20 of them right now, is strategic. Uh, when I worked at the Justice Department, I oversaw about 40 national organizations, Boys and Girls Club America, com National Communities and Schools, American Bar Association, Center for Civic Education, Constitutional Rights, so I learned from all of these 40 groups, a lot of the people who are some of the best in the country, um, how to strategically move things. Um, and so no, it's going to keep growing. I think the, even without COVID, what we've seen every year since 1993, um, it hasn't been cyclical up and down. It just kept growing. If I had to just look at the past year, it's an anomaly because of COVID. 
Um, so we just need, that's why we're now expanding beyond just Vegas trainings to all these other areas. Uh, we're going to be funding 15 trainings. We just announced five of them. We're giving 5,000 to each one to pay the hard costs up front. Uh, a lot of times people don't have money to come up with the room rentals, the AV. So, I mean, it's a good five. That's why I put that into the federal grant. And we're passing 85% uh, of the funds through. Uh, we got a $400,000 grant um, for three years and 225 is just mini grants. Uh, we're also gonna be releasing posters, tens of thousands of them they are being designed now with the five different names, Youth Court, Teen Court, and we'll be giving 10 to every program who uh, requests them. So, but you gotta, um, you gotta make it expand. Um, and I think because it's so affordable, because all the volunteer driven stuff, the young adults, the adults that volunteer, the youth, um, it's one of the least expensive programs to operate. Um, you know, so 90% it, it, of them are probably under 100,000. Some are under 50,000, some are under 25,000. Some have budgets of 300,000. You really have to look at the services that take place, the geographic, the uh, large part. Um, but no, no, if you look around the country, it's really condensed into about 10 different states. Um, you know, there's about 10 states where there's 50 or more programs. Um, so there's really about 40 states where you can have a lot of growth. And that's what we're going to do. Um, we're also launching the adult version of it. It's going to be called the Community Acceptance Program. Um, that'll be a separate corporation uh, that we will be launching. But that'll be for age 18 up to seniors. And that's gonna scale very quickly because our youth and teen courts, peer courts, student court and peer jury programs, um, they run them. Uh, they run these uh, already are juvenile ones. And a lot of the people are part-time. Um, a lot of them will choose to run also the CAP programs. Um, and because these youth courts, it's not um, police run them, courts run them, probation runs them, um, bar associations, tribes, youth bureaus, nonprofits, schools, social justice groups. Um, you've got district attorney's offices, public defender offices. Um, so everybody can run these because they're public domain. But yeah, it, it needs another bigger push. I don't see anything on the horizon and I'm pretty involved with things. I don't think anything that's even scaling remotely close to it. Uh, people have been advocating for diversion or alternative to incarceration programs for adults uh, since the 60s. You know, in the 70s, ATI was big, alternative incarceration. But as I've been go all around, it, you can ask people what it, what else has scaled, um, and we want we want more diversion programs. You want to put in place a system of graduated sanctions. Um, Kentucky is really the only state I've seen where there's uh, three things that can happen a law related education program, mandated service and teen court. Um, sometimes other states, it's all combined into one, but um, I don't see anybody moving to something else besides this. I think most of the people who, when you sit down that are the decision makers, um, most are just glad to have one, but I think municipal budgets are gonna be hit hard. And let's face it, even with all this uh, uh, reform, necessary reform going on, what, are the, what really can scale? It's so expensive. These, a lot of these other things cost a half million or a million. And what happens too is elected officials, a lot of times they start these up, but as soon as they lose the next election or two, three terms, um, then they, the program stops because it was somebody else. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. But no, um, this will just keep growing. And um, our intent now as of 2020 to 2030 is gonna be the biggest push from uh, global youth justice and what we're doing. Um, and hopefully down the road, there's three, four more national or international groups doing it. Um, we sell finance a lot of this, Judge Burnett and I do. We don't have to anymore. The past three, four years, we haven't had to put any money into it, but Judge Burnett's not here now, but him and Mrs. Burnett, um, put lots of money into it like us. So no, no, it's going to keep growing, especially with all of us and all the stuff you're all doing, everybody out there. Um, and let's just keep getting it bigger, you know. Scott, here's one from Don Carney. How many youth courts use restorative justice and trauma-informed responses? Um, I don't know. I probably know about 25 of them do, like Don's program um, that Don had back to YMCA and then now with his uh, new initiative. 
Um, that would be interesting to have even like a subcommittee or a committee on that to help and grow that. Um, some people, um, you know, restorative justice, a lot of it goes back years from Dr. Gordon Baysmore, especially who I, I met in the early 90s from Florida Atlantic University. Um, some people think restorative justice can be more programs or programmatic. I think there's more elements into it that you can build into the youth court, into the training, into the actual hearing. Um, you know, but if you're not doing community service, I mean, I'm more concerned uh, with making high quality, man you have to use mandated community service if you're talking about justice. Some people might say that sounds harsh, but you then have to volunteer service and service is another field. So if we're, we're talking about justice, mandated or peer imposed. I think that's the most important thing besides training the youth in the hearing. So I think training the youth volunteers, the actual youth court night, if that's what you call your program, and then the mandated service are the three biggest things. And you can build it into the three. Um, so it's really elements of it. You can say we have a restorative based model, which the same kind of thing, I, I guess, if you're looking at it. Um, but I think the having a quality training program for the youth, um, having it organized really well, so they, I mean, they know the cases are court night, you know, when you're using your language you use, conciliatory things, you know, using conflict mediation, you're not yelling questions, um, and you're all there to help. I think it's also important to shift the young people around in different roles, you know, so you're not the prosecutor every time. Some programs do that, five or 10%. Um, I like some of the ideas people have had around, you know, if you have a team, one week you're the judge, maybe next time when you have a case or the prosecutor, depending on the model, it varies. And then you're the defender, then you're maybe the clerk bailiff or the floor person. That way the young people get to experience all the different roles and youth development wise, you're not developing and I got you kind of stigma. You know, we don't want to do that. That's not the purpose. Um, so I think there's a number of things that need to be done. But at the same time, uh, our approach at Global Youth Justice is we don't mandate how you have to do anything. It's not up to us. We don't have any control over it. We try to give people the best information to do what they're doing. Uh, we don't support even some of these states that have come in and tried to, like Utah recently. Uh, we got in with the local programs and, and got rid of the state person who was trying to mandate funding to do things a certain way. I think it should be very local, um, whether it's tribes, communities, um, however it is. Um, and you just have to give them the best information. Some communities have no money. I, I went to the opening. I've been to over 200 youth courts I've visited from Alaska to Harlem. Um, I've spoken at like 30 of the state events um, and uh, you know thousands of the staff. Um, and I, I just think communities and tribes why this expands is because people can make it work with what they have. Maybe an SRO is doing this part time or uh, a public defender's office is taking it on. Um, but what I need to I think we need to really do is to like I talked about, we have a lot of half time people in our programs, we need to kind of try to those people who want it to be a full time job. So they stay, so they get benefits, so they get, they're being paid like a social worker or a uh, similar job where they're getting paid decent money and stay because turnover can be really hard. Um, but Scott, yeah. we have, Scott, we, we have two more questions. Sure. Uh, in about, in about four minutes. Okay. Uh, many grants ask for the program to be evidence based in order to apply. How do youth courts respond to that required question? And the next one, uh, don't know if I missed it but is there an adult volunteer in your program? So let's see if we can wrap it up in about four minutes. Okay, um, evidence-based, um, in all my years and all these uh, federal office and everything, I've never seen a re uh, recidivism large scale study done um, on any juvenile justice program. If you get onto our website, all six of the under research button under uh, resources, it lists the five studies that have been done. All of them have been about a year. Um, track. There's three standard forms of recidivism. There's rearrest, conviction, and incarceration. We just tried for a year and a half to have global youth justice with all these local programs uh, to do recidivism. But the thing that you need is you need a minimum of 1,200 cases within a two-year period. Um, and where it becomes a challenge is um, no program has that many cases. 
but also you have to, at the point of referral, uh, it's like flipping a coin, right? You have to basically say to a parent, for your kid's eligible for diversion, but for the sake of science, I have to give you a 50-50 chance your kid's gonna go in the system. So that's where you get into this empirical, logical design. Um, and who wants to have half the kids go into, uh, who's gonna want their son, daughter, or if you're a caretaker guardian, who's gonna want your kid to go into the system for the sake of science? So you literally can't talk about um, having to recidivism wise on a large scale to really be empirically designed. The ones I mentioned, they're short term, um, three in Maryland, um, Independence, Missouri, they all came out good, but they're six months in a year. Um, we don't even know how, we tried with 30 different teen courts and youth courts wanna do the research uh, with us, but as a researcher said, and then, you have to track it for three years after that, then do the data. It came out, almost, we, the best people in the country were behind this. And we were at the Arnold Foundation. The budget, the cheapest one was $5.8 million. So the two research firms, one's in California, University of Riverside, brilliant, brilliant man. Um, and so helpful, but it's one, it, it's too cost prohibitive. Nobody's gonna pay for it. And um, that's not gonna uh, work. And adults, what do you mean by adult volunteers in our program? Well, uh, it, it, I just copied the question. Uh, that's the, uh, are there adult volunteers? I think you may have answered it because uh, you've covered just a vast amount of material, uh, yeah. but there are many vo adult volunteers. The more the merrier uh, to be able to uh, fill the gaps as kids that come into the program and are there for maybe a year or two or three, and they graduate, there, there seems to be a lot of difficulty in continuity. So if parents will stay, they can help shepherd the, the new kids in as the other kids graduate and move on to their, their careers in college. Uh, this has been a sensational presentation. Yeah. I just want to, yeah, and Go thank ahead. you to everybody watching, especially the adult staff. I'm, I'm your biggest cheerleader, uh, kind of my role. I do some other things too, but um, this has been our main thing, Global Health Justice. And we're going to be having some fellowships and internships come up. And so just reach out to us, anybody, what you need. My, uh, Email is just scott, S-C-O-T-T -T, dot Peterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N at globalyouthjustice.org. Um, and so we're doing our best, you know, and we've got a lot of good people and we'll add people to our board. So we're excited about Global Youth Justice and we're going to go after a lot of opportunities to um, help the local programs more we can. We try our best. There's still more stuff to do, but we're, we're, we're trying. Do what we can afford. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for your fine presentation, Scott. And uh, I want to remind everybody we have uh, a session on resume building and interview edit coming up uh, at noon. And also Stop San Quentin Outbreak Coalition, a moment in the abolition movement and understanding trauma and trauma-informed practices. So there's an exciting afternoon of uh, further uh, presentations, which I hope people will stay and enjoy. and. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the, the next event like this. And I'm sure Scott would love to see you at one of the uh, Global Youth Justice uh, conferences as well. There yeah, we got to do a training in up. California. We got to do one of our big trainings in California. We'll be looking forward to it. So we're at our time limit. And thank you so much for being with us today. Enjoy the rest of the day, folks. <laughs>